Hello, Teresa. Thank Hi, you. So <laughs> Thank you so much for being with me today to share a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm so honored that you're teaching with wheat and you're bringing your depth of skills and practice in mindfulness and meditation to our students. So I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about yourself and your journey and what brought you to your interest in mindfulness. So it all started in 1997. So those of us in Manitoba will remember it was the year of the flood, which caused, um, it was the water goddess, right? Coming into our communities and, and destroying some things. And, and when I think of destruction, I also see that it's, it, it's a cleansing process. It's a purifying process. So what happened for me that summer was I decided that I was going to go to India, which is my ancestral land, because um, as a family therapist, I found it really difficult to bring spirituality, to bring a contemplative awareness into my practice. And so I decided I'm going to make this soul journey to India and somehow, you know, become more clear about about what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do that. And so I did go to India. I went, I went to a work, I went to a retreat in Bodh Gaya and um, was in a retreat with a Tibetan monk. And that was real, that was completely transformative. It was a completely different world. Mm -hmm. And five days, um, for five days after that, I had the privilege and the honor of being in teachings with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So after both those experiences, it became really clear to me that, that the practice of meditation and mindfulness is really what I wanted to take back to my work. And uh, yeah, so that's how it began. Wow, that's a beautiful story. And I know your your process has only deepened from there with training with some of the most highly regarded mindfulness train teachers. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the, the teachers that you've worked with. So the teacher who I think of is my heart teacher is Thich Nhat Hanh. And Darcy, you were actually the person who told me about his retreat in uh, Estes Park so many years ago. And that's how even though I had followed him, I, I don't think I would have known about that. And that was, you might remember, he wasn't there <laughs> physically, but he was there in every sense of the word. Like his presence was so clear in everyone, in the monks and in the nuns. And um, yeah, so he's really been my heart teacher. And really my teachers have been... Um, the people I work with, especially the teenagers, because for 18 years, every year, I did a group on mindfulness for teens. And these were, you know, youth that we think of as high-risk youth, um, who had been through many, many challenges. And I really wanted, wanted to see if, if this practice could be of some benefit for them. And, um, you know, like any other practice, some people are more attuned to it and some are less attuned and it depends on what's happening in their life. But I really fine-tuned my own practice through, through, through my offering to them, partly because I had to become more clear and also because of what it evoked in me, right? What it brought into my awareness. So, so, so they were my, in some ways, they were my biggest teachers. And because I bring mindfulness into my therapeutic work, the families that I work with as well are my teachers. In a different way, in a more formal, I don't know if the word is formal, but um, I just completed a two-year mindfulness uh, meditation teacher's training with Jack Hornfield and Tara Brack, who, who many of you might know, they have been, they are long-time teachers, they're both therapists, yeah. I remember reading A Path with Heart when it first came out, Jack Cornfield's book, and just remember that being such a profound and beautiful book to read. And 
you've had a deep immersion with Jack Cornfield and Tara Brock. I'm wondering if you could share what your takeaway is or takeaways in terms of making mindfulness accessible to a broader array of people and how Jack Cornfield and Tara Brock do that. What, how do they, what do they offer that allows us that kind of inroad into mindfulness training for folks that may never even have heard of it or have a sense of what it's all about? I think it's a combination of things. When I think of Jack and Tara, I feel they really complement each other. When I think of Jack, I just I just think and I have this sense of a field of compassion. And when I think of Tara, I think of this this pool of clarity. You know, so it's 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 the clarity or the wisdom and the compassion, which is also wisdom, right? So that's how I feel they complement each other. And the way they make it so real for us is because of a combination of things, Darcy. They share from their personal lives. They, they, share, they share about their struggles and they also share about how they have, how they continue to walk through the journey. And they talk about things that all of us want to know, like how do I, what do I do when anger comes up and, um, yeah, just well, what do I do when it comes up? Is that a bad thing? Is it a good thing? Um, you know, so they talk about things like that. Or how do I really make compassion a a, a real a real embodied practice? You know, and these are things that it doesn't matter whether we are whether whatever the workplace is. Uh, those are qualities that I think are so important in any relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you're drawing on all these rich traditions, your own spiritual practice, um, your experience as a family therapist, your walk with Thich Nhat Hanh and, the, and his teachings, and then the, the work of Tara Brock and Jack Kornfield and pulling all of this together. And our context is workplace training in equity, diversity, and inclusion. And, you know, my mind starts moving with that idea of bringing all of that together to help people um, understand that work differently. And I do feel like this is a different approach to working with, with questions and challenges in the workplace. Can you talk a little bit about how you see that and maybe how that's even working for you in, or has worked for you in your work, workplace as you brought mindfulness into your work? Yeah, so, um, well, the first way in which I brought it into my workplace was, um, was uh, really through my work with the teens. And, and then in terms of my relationship, my encounters with my colleagues, with my supervisors, a lot of times it was really helpful when I felt reactive, when annoyance come up, came up or irritation came up, when judgment came up. And it really helped me to, it really helped me to take care of my emotions. And I like that word rather than managing emotions. You know, you might remember Darcy Thich Nhat Hanh talks about how when a baby cries, we don't shake the baby or we don't put the baby in a separate room. We hold the baby with tenderness, with love, with presence. And in the holding, something shifts, right? Mm -hmm. And so the process actually of, of meeting our emotions, because th those are that's a part of us, is really that same process of, of being with, of holding, of staying. And, and in the process of doing that, something shifts. Mm -hmm. Okay, beautiful. Yeah, and so I'm just thinking of a workplace wherein people are utilizing some of these awarenesses and how that might look, sound, feel different 
than a workplace where there's no awareness of mindfulness in terms of managing conflict or just the daily annoyances, as you say, that come up in, in a workplace. What's your sense of how things can look, feel, and sound different when bringing mindfulness into your life and into your workplace? Yes, and I can speak from that from, from a lived experience in my own uh, workplace, just based on what some of my colleagues have told me since practicing mindfulness. And, and, and part of some of what they've said is it's really helped them like really be kinder, kinder to themselves and, and kinder to others. You know, so that's and that's 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 a big one. I remember when you and me did a workshop with teens years ago, that was one thing that stood out for me where they said that they are kinder to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I also I, I also find that with a practice of mindfulness, we become clearer. We become more clear whether it's clarity about our goals, about the direction we want to take, or clarity about a situation which can be really confusing. Mm. Because very often we try to problem solve and we use just part of our brain, our le left brain, right? And, and really mindfulness integrates the left and right brain so that we can see the whole picture and um, and so I think clarity is something that that changes in the workplace. People are able to be more clearer. They are able to be more compassionate. Mm -hmm. And something that's always stood out for me was this whole idea of how, and I'm speaking for myself as well, of course, you know, we can all have fixed ideas of people. And in the, in the practice of mindfulness, we start to, because we start to meet people where they are at, we start to notice that who they were yesterday is not who they are today. But if I'm still holding on to, you know, my view of them from yesterday or from a week ago, then I'm not really seeing that person. And I'm relating to my image rather than to the real person. Mm -hmm. And so, as you can imagine, that can cause a lot of conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I hear you referring to the practice. And, you know, for our Weaving Braids of Belonging, we have a 10-week spring training option and then the, the option to go into the Rivers of Solidarity program, which is a one-year program. And could you talk a little bit about mindfulness as a practice and how having support by a trained facilitator and practitioner can make a difference in the learning journey for a student who's wanting to embark on this and, you know, integrate this work into their life? Yes. So I often say, you know, when we want to learn how to swim, we, we, we can't just think about it or read up about it, right? <laughs> or the same with making love. You can talk about it all you want, but if you don't make love, you don't know what it's what it is. <laughs> and so it's the same with mindfulness. The, the re, you can read about it, and I think it's very seductive. The ideas are very seductive, and we can stay at just that, at having the knowledge, having the information, but that really doesn't, it doesn't do very much in terms of us changing ourselves or becoming aware of our own beauty or becoming aware of, of what we think of as not beautiful because we don't know how to find the seed of beauty in that. So that's a whole lot of things I said. So what I mean is behind anger, if I'm able to stay with my anger, you know, through a particular process, then I might become aware that um, there's something I, they, they, there's a clear, they, the, the message from anger becomes really clear in terms of what I need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that reminds me of that quote. I think it's John Cabot Zinn, wherever I go, there I am. Yes. You know, that <laughs> we're not getting away from anything. We're just going deeper within and being more present and more caring and more tender with the thoughts and feelings that are arising within us. 
Yeah. So just to go back a bit to your question, uh, Darcy, in the course, you know, people might be asking, you know, is this course for me? I already have a practice of mindfulness. And if you do, if if you have a practice of mindfulness, that's great. I know for myself, I never really thought of using the practice of mindfulness in situations around race, around uh, other forms of diversity or inequity. I honestly never did till maybe three years ago, you know? And so, and I wonder how many people really think of that because oftentimes when we see someone as being different from us, either because they look different or talk different or sound different or have different ways of thinking, we we become afraid sometimes. Sometimes we just withdraw, right? And I found that the practice of mindfulness, of really being present, has really shifted things for me in that way. So, yeah. So if you have a practice of mindfulness but have never thought of how you might specifically apply it to to how to respond when you're faced with differences that that bring up some turmoil in you, then this is a good course to take. Mm -hmm. If you've never practiced mindfulness, it's still a good place to take. Mm -hmm. It's still a good course to take because you will learn not just what mindfulness is, but we will do the practices in the classes so that you really get a sense of what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you talked a little bit about left brain, right brain, and and using you know all of our understanding and you know bringing all of us to the practice, all of ourselves. Um, so we're in a unique situation in that we're a therapeutic arts school, and so we have that unique vantage point of seeing things through the arts. And I know you have a particular. Um, uh, you know, skill around using mindfulness in movement and movement practices, and also through, you know, visual arts. Could you talk a little bit about the use of art as a tool for that, you know, embracing the present moment and how we use art in mindfulness? Yeah. So creating art of any kind, whether it's working with clay or with playing with color or movement, really engages the right brain. And, and this is really important because oftentimes the left brain has the stories that we've told ourselves again and again and again and again. So it's habit, right? And when we engage in any artistic process, it brings both the hemispheres together. So we have a more whole picture and specific and, and, and with movement, I like to say that we often colonize the body with the mind, with the intellect, right? And really the language of the body is sensation and movement, it's not words. So when we are able to move, and it doesn't matter how big the movement is or how small the movement is, that when we start to move with awareness, we really, come home to ourselves, we come home to our body, but the mind also starts to settle, you know, the racing mind starts to slow down and we start to get insights and awareness in my experience that we wouldn't get if I ask questions. Right. Yeah, so the access point is not through the mind. You have another access point that that makes the the understanding more accessible in a sense. Right, right. Yeah, yeah I was thinking of that um, when Tara Brock refers to James Joyce and his character, Mr. Duffy, who lives a short distance from his body. And just that idea of embodiment and as you've described it, kind of coming home to yourself. And that idea of embodiment is um, maybe a newer term for some folks. Can you talk a little bit about what embodiment means and how that can shift our daily lives and our experience in our workplaces and really our relationships with ourselves? 
Yeah, so for me, when I am embodied, it means that I experience something with my whole being. It's not just a thought in my mind. And it's and it's a, it's definitely a body experience. So for example, when I'm guiding people in a practice, sometimes I might say something like, you know, notice the pain in your foot or notice the sensation in your foot. And, and people say, I know exactly what's happening in my foot because I've had this pain for a long time. So what they're really doing, that's really a mental awareness that they have the pain in their foot. And the invitation is to be aware of the pain or the discomfort or even the lightness, you know, the lightness in your foot right in this moment. So embodiment can't happen in the past or in the future. It can only happen in the present. And of course, the present is moment to moment to moment to moment, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I think of Jack, for example, I think he embodies compassion because I see it in his eyes. I feel it in his presence. I, I, I find it in the words he uses. So really, it's, it's like the whole person exudes that quality. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say, because this is not about perfection, right? It's not about perfection. This mm -hmm. is this is a journey that we we continue. Mm -hmm. But it's about embodying as much as we can. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we could just take a few moments, Teresa, to, um, you know, be with one of the teachings that you have. Like, would you like to just guide us through a few moments right right in this moment putting the focus on where we are right now could you could you lead us in in something yes okay so just inviting you wherever you are whether you're sitting or standing or lying down to just bring your awareness to your body and just noticing what shape your body is taking. Just feeling the shape your body is taking. And just finding a way to, to be in your body that evokes a sense of dignity for you. And in this practice, you can have your eyes open or you can have them lightly shut. And then inviting you to just take your attention to your feet. And just feel whatever sensation is there. And the sensation you might feel is just the pressure of your foot on the floor or on the carpet, wherever it is. And then inviting you to bring your attention to your spine. Just noticing how your spine supports you. and inviting you to simply receive the support. And if that's not available to you right now, because of some discomfort in the spine, then just notice that it's there. And inviting you to bring your attention to the weight of your body on the chair. And then moving your attention gently to your belly. And just feeling the movement of your belly as your body breathes itself. And so for the next few moments, let's just do that. Feeling the body breathing itself. 
through the movement of the belly. And if your mind wanders away, because that's what minds do, it's not a big deal. As soon as you notice that, just gently bring your awareness back to your belly breathing itself. And again, if the mind has wandered away, which it very likely has for many of us, just gently bring your awareness back to your belly. And then inviting you to start to get ready to come back to our shared presence here. So you might want to wiggle your toes, your fingers, maybe stretch a bit. And I just want to say one more thing, Darcy, about the practice, because in my experience, people often get discouraged because they say, my mind has wandered away like a million times. And this is the thing that every time we become aware that the mind has wandered away, that's a present moment. Mm. And some people like to talk about it as building the muscle of mindfulness. I really like to remember that it's, a pre it's the present moment. So nothing is lost. Nothing is lost when the mind wanders away and we become aware of it. Yeah. It's funny. I just thought of that quote of like noticing the soft animal of our body. And, you know, and when I just breathing into my belly, I just felt that like I could as easily be a cat, you know, with my awareness dropped right down or, or a dog lying stretched out, just breathing. And with that settledness of an animal, being itself without <laughs> without the, the more human preoccupations so i'm excited for people to have the opportunity to work with you teresa and especially over time for people that are able to you know find the time to take the longer program but certainly to be introduced to this work in the spring training so um, i know we'll hear more from you in other in other videos but i just want to take a moment to thank you for your your practice for your trainings that have gone into you know making you who you are as a teacher and your experience as a therapist and you know working with so many diverse peoples i know that influences how you show up in the world and how you show up as a teacher so i feel really grateful that you're with us at wheat on the journey and uh, we will hear from you again so thank you again Thank you, Darcy. Bye for now.